So this next paper assumes that you are gonna use a rectifier, a ReLU activation function. So they introduce a new activation function, parametric ReLU. This is ReLU. And this is parametric ReLU, where A is a parameter that you're gonna learn from your data. And if you write it in a functional form, this is what you get. This is the maximum of zero and yi, and ai, minimum of zero and yi. AI, you can learn it, and that's called parametric ReLU. If it's zero, you get ReLU back. If it's a constant, usually small constant, that's gonna be called leaky ReLU. If it's a constant and you are not training it, it's just fixed, that's leaky ReLU. And here I is different channels. So per each channel, you can have a different AI. How do you train it? Because these have to be trained. You take the gradient of your loss function with respect to this parameter and use momentum method to train this. So what happens? This small change reduces your top five from 13.34 to 12.75 when you are doing it channel-wise and you're training it channel-wise. If you have a single A for all of your channels, this is the top five that you get. And for leaky ReLU with this particular parameter, that's what you get. You have a better top one, but a worse top five. And this paper is about this type of activation functions. So the initialization of your weights and biases depends on the activation function. So what should we take into consideration? A good indicator is gonna be the variance of the response in each layer. That's the central idea of this paper, how to initialize. Basically, if this is your XL, L is your layer. L could be one, two, three, four, up until capital L. XL, you are putting all of your image, not all of your image, that particular uh, window of the image that you're sliding over your image you're putting everything inside this X. So what is gonna be the size of this? It's gonna have K by K pixels. K is the size of your kernel. And then it's gonna have C channels. And then N is gonna be K times K times C, so K squared C. And the rest of it is just matrix multiplication to give you another output. Is that clear? This is another way of thinking about convolutions. K is your filter size and N is the number of connections of a response. So it's basically K squared times C. So you have this image, let's say this screen is our image. We take a particular window that is K by K of the image. And each pixel we know it's C dimensional. It can have red, green, blue, or if you are in one of your layers, it could be the number of filters that you have. So you are taking a cube here and putting everything inside one vector, XL. And then you're gonna have D filters that are of the same size, and you're just multiplying that particular window by that kernel that you have. And that's gonna be 
the inner product of two vectors. Now you have multiple inner products, therefore it's just a matrix product. So D is the number of filters, the output filters, and your WL is D by N now. And DL is your bias, is in our D. And YL is gonna be the response at the pixel of the output map. So what did we just do? We want to know what is the value of this pixel in the output map. And each pixel is gonna be a vector in RD. So it's gonna have D dimensions. So what you do is just multiply this weight, which is D by N, by a vector that's N by one, and that's gonna give you a vector that's in RD. So this guy is in RD and bias is in RD that's gonna give you the value of one pixel. So please ask questions if it's not clear. So when you're breaking, when you're breaking your like window down, you just stack it sort of by columns or by rows or some sort of predetermined. Yes, but it doesn't really matter, yes? Because mm. in the end, you're gonna compute the inner product and the inner product has a summation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the order doesn't matter. As long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter whether it's row wise, column wise, or. But the idea is that you get a window that is k by k by c, and then you flatten it, flatten it out. In the end, you're gonna get a single vector in R n. But then we know what its size is, it's k squared by c. Because you had k pixels and c channels. So I want this to be as clear as possible. If you have any questions, I want all of you to understand this. Because this is a nice way to think about convolutions. It's nothing but a vector matrix multiplication. And then this is like the YL would be what slides over the entire window to give you your spatial like representation. So YL is going to be a pixel being outputted from your convolution. So the input to the convolution is X, the output to the convolution is Y. The input to the convolution is X, the output of convolution is Y. And it's just one of the pixels in the output, which is gonna be d-dimensional. The dimensions of y are then the dimensions of the number of channels in your next input. Exactly. Ah, uh, right. Exactly, and d is basically the number of filters that you have. Yes. Okay, so you have every matrix vector multiplication is just d dot products. Okay, just many dot products. So sorry, you said while becomes one by D, right? Yes. Okay. It's gonna be in our D. So how are these layers related to each other? This is very important. The output of the previous layer is gonna go through a nonlinearity and that's gonna give you the input to this layer. Is that correct? This is ReLU. So the output of the previous layer is gonna go through a nonlinearity and that's gonna give you the current input to your neural network. And that's how things become deep. Same thing happens for YL. It goes through a nonlinearity and then it's, become, it's gonna become XL plus one. Is that clear? And how are the dimensions related? The number of output channels from the previous layer is equal to the number of input channels. Now, 
for this layer. So these are just a bunch of identities. CL is equal to DL minus one. XL is a nonlinearity applied to YL minus one. So I'm gonna ask a question, is it clear? And then I need you to write yes or no, or answer yes or no. Is everything clear? Yep. Okay, perfect. I don't want you to get stuck in the notation. So what are we gonna do now? As I said, we are gonna take a look at the variance of the response, basically variance of YL. What happens to the variance of YL? You are doing matrix vector multiplication. So there is gonna be a summation over N, basically of the size N. It means that you are gonna have an L different variances. And the variance of the bias is just zero. That's what you assume. And then you assume BL is independent from WL times X. These are the assumptions that you make. So you're gonna have a summation of similar things. And that's why you get an L times variance of WL XL. And WL is just one of these, uh, one of the rows of this big WL, capital WL. Okay, perfect. How do we make the assumption that the weights are zero mean? That's an assumption that you make because this is under your control. Because what is the final end? You want to initialize these weights. So we are gonna initialize it with a random number that has mean zero. That's a great uh, question, okay. but then it's under your control. Cool. Yeah. So you have full control over the mean of your weights. And it's a good assumption. You can just uh, have a normal with mean zero and some variance. And you sample from that to initialize your weights. So that assumption you make, and this is just an identity. So I want you to, this is an exercise. The variance of two random variables is equal to that. And if you just Google variance of the product of two random variables, this is gonna show up as one of the formulas. So what is the, what is the spectra of that matrix look like? we are gonna take a look at that later. So now there is no matrix, it's just inner products. And then you're just multiplying things, okay? This is a particular entry of this matrix, which is gonna be a random variable. That's the assumption that you make, okay? So what happens? The mean of these WLs, the entries of your filters, we assumed it to be zero. So the variance is equal to the expected value, the second moment. But there is a catch. This is not true. The second moment of XL is not equal to the variance of XL because you are using this ReLU nonlinearities. So this is your XL and there is no guarantee that it has a mean zero. It's coming out of a nonlinearity. If it had mean zero, this would be true. This would be equality, but now it's inequality because there is no guarantee that the mean is zero. So what are we doing? What is YL? It's a random element of YL, WL, is a random element of this matrix and XL is a random variable representing your input. So this is to explain the notation up there. I think I'm gonna stop here. We are one minute over time. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. And for those of you who want to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. Are 
I, is there anything, um, I guess there's always square um, filters. Has there ever been like non-square filters? So you have like a K by some other value? You could, but the convention is they usually assume they are equal, but that's perfectly fine. You can have different filter sizes. Basically you can have K1 and K2. But usually they assume they are square. Because if you think about it, things are symmetric. A pixel on top could be a pixel on the left or a right. So if you rotate a, an image, whatever that's inside that image, which could be a dog, is it still a dog? Okay, so things are symmetric around your pixel. That's why they usually assume K is equal to, K1 is equal to K2. Right. Any other questions? I had a quick question about uh, dropout. So from a couple lectures ago. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, so the sort of like last step um, in dropout is after you've trained, you, uh, you update your weights by multiplying by that like probability, whatever dropout probability you had. Um, and my question was just in most uh, sort of software for building neural networks, is that just implicitly done during training that at the last sort of step of training, they'll update the weights one last time? Or is that an action that is usually carried out every time when you're doing an inference? You mean there is a discrepancy between training and testing, yes? Is that your question? Well, because we talked about for dropout that after you've, that your weights for testing are like the expected value of the weights for training, right? Like the average? Yes. And I was just curious if that's a, like during training, in most softwares, did they do that step for you? No. So no. during training, things are fine because you just multiply by a random vector, uh -huh. that's Bernoulli, and then it's gonna kill some of your outputs, some uh -huh. of them. Okay, that's during training. But during testing, uh, you have to shrink your weights basically by the probability of those guys being absent or present. And will that be done every time in an inference? Like each time? In an inference, what happens is that you already have your weights and biases trained, the weights of your neural network. Uh -huh. And then you can just give it to somebody else. But yeah. then as you give it to somebody else, you have to tell them what is your P. The okay. Probability of dropping a neural network. Okay. So uh, that, that sorry. So that, that can be carried out yes, when they're so that they can do it the same way that you did it. Okay. Sure. But then during testing things are deterministic. 